Dominican born and Bronx raised, Olga is a prolific freelance writer that has written for such publications as Refinery29, Sojourners, and The Huff Post, to name a few. As a polyglot, Olga has worked for a law firm where she translated documents from Italian to English and was then an intern at the United Nations providing assistance to the Dominican Republic mission to the UN where she translated documents from English to Spanish. Uh, from there, Olga has worked at the renowned American magazine, The Jesuit Review, for seven years where she was reporter and the associate editor of the culture and op-ed section. Um, while there, she covered some amazing topics like the Jesuit-led transformation of the criminal justice system, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, and the creation of the Church Two movement, among many others. It's with great pleasure that I welcome you to In All Things, and uh, where we get to speak about your vocation. Thank you so much for inviting me to uh, join you today. It's I'm in the middle of book writing, so it's fun to take a break to just talk to another Catholic about the world. So thank you. Oh, well, I'm 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 happy that you're able to to step back from that. I imagine that's a, a big task. Um, well, to start off, you know, we won't do anything uh, too too heavy. I have a game of rapid fire questions, so feel okay. free answer as you will, and uh, whatever comes to mind. So. Okay. First, your favorite encyclical. Amoris Laetitiae. Is that, an, is that an encyclical? I can never even remember what church document is which. <laughs> oh, we'll chalk it up to it. Uh, your, favorite, your favorite saint. Sheesh, I don't think I have a favorite saint, but I like to think about activists who have died as saints in this movement. So I always look up to them and pray to them. So. Oh, nice. Uh, favorite book of the Bible. Um, I know this is kind of a cliche for a Catholic who hasn't really read the Bible, but I have such a nostalgic attachment to Psalms because yeah. anytime I got in trouble in elementary school, I had to write out <laughs> Psalms. So those are the only, the few lines of scripture that I can actually quote. <laughs> uh, what hip hop song would make a great Catholic hymn? What hip hop song? Ooh, that's a really good one. I think Kendrick Lamar's All Right. I think mm -hmm. because it just naturally creates like connects to the world we're in and also it's just the wake-up call to the bishops <laughs> and the last one of rapid fire round uh the greatest act of catholic charity that you've ever seen honestly i think all of the black and brown nuns in the church who have been doing this work years before i was even born who are now like teaching me how to be a liberatory catholic so oh. That's that's very interesting. It's a lot of a lot of insight into to history and the, what you've seen. Mm -hmm. um, I guess uh, to kick us off, I'm, I'm curious to know how would you say your Catholic your Catholic faith has um, impacted you as a writer? How has it made you focus on some of the things that you focused on? Yeah, so I think it's basically affected every part of my life since I arrived in this country in the early 90s. And I didn't fully understand this until I started working, until I became a, full, a freelancer full time and just kind of committed my time entirely to working on this book. And I think it really, for, for most of my 20s, I've always known I wanted to be a writer, but I think it was after years of reporting that I finally realized, oh, no, 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 this is a vocation because you're in a church that wants to act as if we are in a post-racial society. We have a church that wants to ignore a lot of the experiences that people who look like you and I live with every single day. So I think by the time I turned 30, I fully was like, oh, okay, this is where God has brought me to. He put me in Catholic schools my whole life so that I could internalize what it means to be, to understand justice, right? Like the Sisters of Mercy in high school, they really made us understand that to be a Catholic and to be a woman meant to be a woman for others. And I think that fully came full circle when I became a writer. And I was like, oh, okay, this is what those nuns were hammering in when I was in high school, because they know that whatever our skill might be, whether it's, you know, producing video, writing, being an ER doctor, those are, those are vocations and those are skills, whatever you're doing, that you can use to make a, the world a better place. And I think that if it wasn't for Catholicism, I would have had a very hard time understanding, and I still do, I'm still kind of grappling with what it means to envision a more liberated world, but I think that would be so much harder for me if I didn't have Catholic social teaching or all of the spirituality that our faith allows us to really internalize. And I think that it really, Catholicism really gave me the space to learn how to write and learn how to write for justice, you know? 
Yeah, that's that's that's. Uh, would would you say that um, there's any particular encyclical? Because you know, I, I, in the rapid fire, would you say some of the encyclicals played a, a big role in uh, fueling that internal fire for your writing, or I, is it just just the upbringing as as a whole that grounding that you had? I think not so much. I think yes, church documents. I think statements from the bishops, statements from Pope Francis. I think that those have definitely helped me learn how to be critical of our church. But I think that being very specifically in a Jesuit space at the time when I was learning how to write, at the time when I was learning how to even read a church document, right? Like before I started at America, I didn't even know that the bishops were these statements. I didn't know that, I didn't know what an encyclical was. I didn't know what an exhortation is, you know? And being in a Jesuit space, they really help me to be curious and to realize that you don't need a theology degree to talk about faith. You can read what Pope Francis is saying and talk about it in your own life. And I think that being in that space really helped me to develop a Catholic framework for my writing. And I think that if I had started right out of college in a place, in a secular place, I wouldn't be the writer that I am today. Mm. Would you say uh, that those periods of discernment, uh, really learning how to engage uh, with that spirituality. Would you say that was a big driver for some of the topics you took on, like uh, the the church to uh, church church to movement? Because I know it's very easy for people to see these sort of things and think, mm -hmm. "Oh, this is critical. This is not helping." Mm -hmm. But what's your? Uh, how did that play a role in your your perspective on on that's impact with uh, on oh, things like church to? Oh yeah, yeah, that definitely being with the Jesuits definitely impacted me because I realized that here were these people who were in this church, right? And I had by then already these kind of preconceived idea, these preconceived ideas about white Catholicism, about what white Catholics did or what they believed, even clergy, because of my experience at Fordham. And then these Jesuits introduced me to the missionary work that they were doing, the education work that they were doing, and the fact that they were going to these places and even, you know, you mentioned the Thrive for Life project, just seeing the ways that Jesuits were like, okay, we're men of God, we take vows of poverty, we're meant to serve, here's what that looks like, right? And the fact that they don't shy away from doing the hard work, I think that made me realize like, oh, okay, if they're doing it, then you have to do it too, right? Like you can't just say, oh, I'm a Christian because I go to church on Sundays, right? You have to, how are you using your vocation? How are you demanding that the church you're in be better? And I think, again, it, it took me leaving America to realize like, oh, wow, I literally internalized everything that these Jesuits were teaching me. And I'm so grateful for that because I think it, again, really makes me realize that you have to tell these stories. I think as journalists, we're often conditioned to say that you have to be fully removed from the stories you're telling, from the communities that you're telling. And the Jesuits showed me, actually, you don't, right? You have to be moved because when you're moved by the spirit, that's when you actually write authentically or when you create authentic content. And I'm so grateful that, I, again, that I was in that space and I was able to cultivate my voice. Mm. Yeah. And uh, you're, after reading a, a lot of your work, your, your voice uh, struck me very uh, prophetic at times. You know, it, it reminded me of readings of like um, uh, Bell Hooks or Cornell West in, in that sort of vein, but more mm -hmm. obviously with the, the, the Catholic bent. Uh, with those kind of in mind, uh, as I was reading that, it made me wonder, do you see your writing as a, as a tool for freedom, uh, as a tool for liberation for people? Yes and no. Yes, mm -hmm. because I definitely want white Catholics and I'm just also other people of color, right? Because I think while I see it in my own communities like Latinos, we are also oppressed by the system, but we often don't want to talk about anti-Blackness. So I often... In that sense, I view my writing as a liberatory tool to make people realize like, hey, I felt all of the uncomfortable things. I whitewashed myself. I was really, you know, problematic when I was a teenager, but here's how I've grown and here's how the faith, you can use the faith to do that. But I say no only because one thing I'm kind of struggling with now is that I've reported on these things for so many years, right? And no one was kind of like, not that people weren't interested in, oh no, I think that's fair. I think now we're seeing people want to say Black Lives Matter and people want to care about these things. But for a lot of years, I was doing the reporting again, because you, as we mentioned earlier, it was my vocation. And I think right now, 
I don't want to lose that. I don't want to make this work about me. And I, I keep returning to Angela Davis, who every time mm-hmm. someone points out the work that she's done and how great she is, and she's like, hey, this is about community. This is about people who are doing this work. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, yes, I want my work to challenge people, but I also want people to know, like, I am pulling from a tradition of thinkers and organizers and religious people who, if they didn't do, even someone like, Brian Massingale or Shannon D. Williams, a black historian, if they did not do the work that they had done, I would not be able to do this work, right? And Mm -hmm. yes, I want to help people to think about liberation more fully, but I want to also say like, hey, I am not doing anything different. Like people have been doing this work and I want to always, I always want to just operate from that sense, if that makes sense in it at all. Oh, it it absolutely does. Uh, We we don't live in silos. We don't operate in silos. definitely epitomize that that notion of uh, standing on the shoulders of giants mm-hmm. and I think that's, a, that's great that you point people in that, that direction because then it opens up a whole new door for other uh, uh, other things for people to read other to tap into other people's vocation you know mm-hmm. you talk about the black nuns and, and that sort of stuff um, so that that is that is very powerful uh, you, as you talk about the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, movement, uh, right now you, you mentioned uh, previously that you're currently working on, on a book mm-hmm. about the Catholic Church and the Black Lives Matter. Uh, can you speak to the importance of this book specifically to Catholicism and, and how do you feel that it, it just fits in your overall uh, vocation? Like, you, yeah. Sure. So, yeah. So, your first question, I think that in this very moment, it's super important for Catholics because I think in the same way that six or seven years ago, I, after attending a march, I was very moved. I had a very profound conversion experience because I felt, okay, I knew that my vocation was calling me to write. And I knew that I was kind of toying with the idea of being baptized into the Catholic church. And then I thought, okay, but if I want to become, if I want to make this institution my permanent home, it's not worthy of people like us yet, right? Because we have bishops who are still not talking about these things and are still not talking about white supremacy and white privilege. And I wanted, and not not that this was my young mind, very much thinking like, you know, I'm in my mid twenties, the church needs to work for my my presence, right? And I think now I realize, oh, okay, you can be in this space and you can, help people to think about what it means to, you know, start to grapple with being what it means to be an anti-capitalist church, right? Start to grapple with how racial capitalism was born in this country and still affects Americans to this day, right? And I think that I'm seeing a lot of Catholics and I'm getting a lot of messages and emails from Catholics who are like, hey, we don't know where to start and we feel so lost and we want to challenge. And this, a lot of these messages that I've been getting in the past months are especially from white Catholics who are like, I want to do this work, but I don't know how. And I want them Mm -hmm. to know that like, Hey, it's going to be a struggle and it's going to be a process. But as long as we're in this together and actively working to change things, we will be okay. You know? Mm -hmm. And I think Mm -hmm. to your second question, I think it just ties to what I said earlier, right? This is just another tool that people can use in the struggle toward liberation, right? If Mm -hmm. someone can read my book and say, you know what? Black Lives Matter is very Christ-like. The Black Lives Matter movement is super Christian and super Catholic, then that's what I want. I want people to say, I cannot believe that for so long we we ignored this movement when Mm -hmm. it is literally embodying so many of the things that we love about our faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I guess it's the, that that notion, it's the, an idea whose time has come. When it comes to uh, white Catholics reaching out and wanting to get uh, ideas and information and, and that sort of stuff, what's, what, what have you been telling people? Honestly, I just point them to the work of black Catholic women. Like I just point them because I think one thing I've learned in my book process is so many Catholic, black and brown Catholic women have reached out to me and said, hey, we know that you're working on a book. Here's some research that might be helpful. Or, hey, we saw that you tweeted about this person and we wanna let you know that scholarship is a little problematic and we wanna make sure that you are getting the right sources for this book. And Mm -hmm. throughout this entire process, they are the only people who have reached out to me, Mm -hmm. um, not, not, not talking about 
priest, as I have a very different relationship with priests, obviously because of my situation with, with because of my America. So I mm-hmm. have a lot of priests who have been super supportive, mm-hmm. um, but they're the ones who have reached out to me and have really challenged my own writing. So anytime anyone asks me, I'm like, hey, Tia Noel Pratt just started the Black Catholic syllabus, go read that. Or even Essa White has written about this for America, go read that. Or Sister Josephine Garrett, who is a black nun who talked about the struggles of being black and trying to be in a religious order that's mostly white women. Mm -hmm. So I always just, whenever I can, try to direct people. Like you said earlier, Mm -hmm. I'm sitting on the shoulders of giants. So I want to make sure to just point them to people who, again, our church doesn't uplift. You know, Mm -hmm. I think when we think of, we think of our everyday faith, right? And we know as people of color that these experiences exist, but mainstream Catholic media Mm. wasn't even up until a few weeks ago that people started talking about these things. So I just always direct them to the work that people have been, black women specifically have been doing in and outside of the church. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. because you do a great job of tying in pop culture to the faith. Uh, like at no point would I've ever thought I would see Bob Berger's link to uh, Catholic <laughs> magazine or something like that. Um, but you do a, a, a fantastic job of tying that, and and I think that's an important thing to uh, well uh, evangelize at some at some level. Uh, mm-hmm. Like one of my personal favorites as part of my research, I, I read a lot, a lot of stuff. As I had told you, uh, you did a comparison of uh, Pope Francis's Amoris Laetitia to Beyonce's Lemonade. Um, so when you do things like that, like for yourself, how important is it to bring uh, pop culture to the Catholic faith or is it bringing the Catholic faith to pop culture? Uh, what sort of impact uh, does that have on, on your writing? Like when you... Yeah, sure. So two of my favorite pastimes, if anyone follows me on any social media, will know is that I love church documents. I love being critical of church documents and I love just sitting with the ways that different members of the church use their voice, how they don't use their voice, and how they, you know, try to get their theological opinions to the masses, right, or to the flock. And you mentioned Pope Francis, who one thing that I think has been so great about him is that he has created this culture where people are less afraid, clergy are less afraid to have these conversations, and people, I think, are much more willing to kind of say, okay, Pope Francis is telling us that everyday people are holy, right? These are, Mm -hmm. he's telling us that theology should be accessible, that everyone should be able to think critically about the faith, right? So when I hear things like that, I think, okay, well, what are some of the things that help me think about what it means to be a sister or what it means to be a partner to my fiance or what it means to be a good daughter to my parents, right? And I think that there are so many examples of that in pop culture, you know, like, Bob's Burgers, like that is an example of a family that's trying to survive in a really capitalist society and is more often than not is failing, but they keep trying because they're a family and they love each other and they're this community. And then something like Beyonce's Lemonade. Here's this black woman who's talking about how hard marriage can be, right? Like how difficult it is to commit your life to a person and here are all the struggles that they went through right she talks about infidelity and trying to learn what it means to forgive someone and the minute i sat with that i thought oh my god this is something that people are always telling me as christians we have to do like i at that point in my life i was also the concept of forgiveness was so foreign to me because i was still in my very young mid-20s mind and i thought okay if you do something awful to me i have the right to shut you out of my life right but here was this document from the pope and here was this album from beyonce who's like essentially idolized as a religious figure in the secular world and here's the overlap right and i think that's so important because you show people that christianity can exist everywhere right catholics love saying oh we have the Catholic imagination that allows us to see God everywhere. And this is what this looks like, right? I think pop culture is so full of so many things that can learn us and really, that can teach us and really kind of challenge us. And I think it's also important to, in a church that's run by all men at the top, and I'm talking about, right, like clergy, priests, bishops, etc. I think it's really important in the context of the American church to refute the whiteness of our church by 
actively centering black and brown women inside and outside of the church who are oftentimes showing us how to be Christians better than a lot of our church leaders, you know? And I think that pop culture can really kind of hone that in for a lot of readers. Mm. Mm. Uh, something I wanted to ask you, uh, like, as we dove have dove through into your vocation and the work that you've done, what uh, what kickstarted it? Like, did you have an aha moment or at some point where you were thinking, "Yes, this 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 right here is why I'm doing this"? Did I have that moment? Mm. Yes, I think that that moment, there have been several of those moments, but I think the very first moment where it really hit me was when I was on the podcast. And I'm so sorry, I don't remember this person's name, but it was just a fellow Catholic young woman of color who sent me a Twitter message or an email and basically said, hey, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for talking about what you're talking about or for covering the issues that you're covering because I almost left this church and I said, you know what, if she's staying, then I can stay, right? And I think that for me, when I started the podcast, I didn't want to be on a podcast, right? I wanted to just be a writer. I wanted to focus on writing. Mm -hmm. And it took me a very long time to kind of work through the discomfort of that moment. And I realized after that message, oh, God is making you grow in a way that you might not like, but look at how you're moving other people, right? Look at the work that you're doing for other people. And I think that was really a moment of humility where I kind of had to set my own ego aside and say, hey, this sucks for you, or you're really afraid of this and you want to move away from it because it makes you uncomfortable, but that's not the answer, right? God wants you to sit with that, right? He wants you to sit in those moments and help yourself grow, but also help people grow. And I think that moment and all of the moments where people reach out to me in the moments where like, it's really hard, you know, (laughs) last time we talked, we talked about how awful 2020 has been and how there's just, there just seems to be like one more thing on top of the other that we just have to process as a Christian community and just as citizens of this world. And I think when I get messages from people or even invitations from you, right? Like Mm -hmm. you are inviting me to talk about these things and I'm so grateful for that. And I think those are reminders that like, there is a community, even if I've never met you face to face, like we are now in a community where we are creating this. And I think Mm -hmm. that that's wonderful. I think again, I just, if it wasn't for my faith, I would have left a long time ago. I would probably not be a writer. That's the really crazy thing about this. Like it took me turning 30 to realize you were trying to run away from Catholicism, but it literally made you the writer that you are. And yeah. I'm just so grateful for the moments that pushed me here. Yeah. That, well, you're, you're here now. Uh, <laughs> you've, you've transitioned from America and now you're freelance. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, do you, what do you hope or what do you think your next phase in your vocational journey is going to be? Um, I can see myself continuing as a writer somewhere or just freelancing or maybe picking up an editing role and just giving people one thing that I was really grateful for at America is that I was given a very and it was a very small space compared to like the larger world but I was given the space to come into contact with women like Tia Noel Pratt, Sister Josephine Garrett, even Brian Massingale like these are thinkers that if I had not been at America I would not have been able to encounter and work with. And I want to, I can see myself stepping into an editorial role where I would give young writers like I was almost 10 years ago, the opportunity to realize like, Hey, you can also do this. Just, you know, like Mm -hmm. your faith. So that's what I hope. And uh, my final question for you is what wisdom can you offer for people trying to identify and cultivate their particular and specific vocational gift? The first thing I will say is to sit with yourself. I think so often I spent such a long time running away from who I was. And I think, Jermaine, you can probably relate to this. Like as people of color, when you're often in predominantly white spaces or in just the world in general, there's so much that makes you want to whitewash yourself or makes you want to cold switch. And I think that we're doing such a disservice to our church when we don't push back against that. And the hope that I have for people like me, people straight out of college is just trust yourself, like trust your experience, trust your voice because you matter. 
even if our church might not have caught up to that, our experiences matter and we need more people like us. So I want people to just realize it's going to be a long process and it's going to be uncomfortable, but we need, we need, we need young people to like do this work too. You know, we need people to come after us and be creative and write about Bob's burgers and about Pope Francis and Beyonce or whatever you want to write about, because I think our church is so much more universal than it actually is right now. And I think that when we get our communities in here, we can, we can really make the church be the church that it wants to be, you know? Man, I feel like that deserves an amen. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Olga, thank you so much for your time. And um, it is great to get insight into your vocation and your faith. And I really hope that uh, people take your message to heart and, and sit with themselves to find their own. So thank you. Thank you so much. This is wonderful.